Hello, welcome to our semiconductor education program. This is Vincent Chan. In this lecture, we are going to continue our lesson on sinusoidal oscillator and focus on a problem solving for Winbridge oscillator. So Winbridge oscillator part two, problem solving. So here's the problem. The first question, okay? On the left hand side shows a Winbridge oscillator with a nonlinear amplitude control. So it's a linear sinusoidal amplifier and surrounded by a nonlinear amplitude control circuit. Again, it's a linear sinusoidal oscillator and surrounded by the external connected the nonlinear amplitude control. So two problems I want to solve. The first question. Find the location of the closed loop. This is the closed loop, right? So there's a closed loop transfer function. So find the location of the closed loop pose. So when you do this, you can ignore the external nonlinear amplitude control circuit, which is con composed by the two dials and the four registers on the right hand side of the circuit from R3 to R6. Okay, so only focus on the Winbridge oscillator. Trying to find the location of the closed loop pose. This is the first question. The second question, assume the dial drop. What dial? The D1 and the D2, the blue dial and the green dial. Assume the dial voltage drop is 0.7 volt. Find the peak to peak. It's the nonlinear amplitude control, right? So find the peak to peak output signal amplitude of this circuit, okay? So now I want to give you 10 minutes to try to solve this on your own. Just try to solve this by yourself, okay? 10 minutes, so I'll be right back. So make sure you capture this, try to solve this. I encourage you to solve this first, okay? So don't just keep listening, and because you need to try to solve this and see what's stuck. Okay, although it's challenging for the beginner. Okay, try to solve this and I'll be back in 10 minutes. This is a little bit hard, right? First of all, let's ignore the nonlinear amplitude control circuit, the limiter circuit, okay? Nonlinear limiter circuit. The purpose of the dial is to limit the output signal amplitude or to decide, to determine the steady state, output sinusoidal signal amplitude. Let's focus on the Winbridge oscillator the core first. The core is composed of the two parts, remember? The first part is the amplified circuit, the blue one. The open loop transfer function. And then the frequency selective network, the purple one. So open loop amplifier, the amplifier and the frequency selective network. And then I said, the core is surrounded by the externally added, the nonlinear amplitude control circuit, the linear sinusoidal oscillator as a core surrounded by the externally connected nonlinear amplitude control circuit, which is highlighted by the red, the red okay? Nonlinear amplitude control, the red one. So now let's focus on the core, the loop gain. So this is something that I show you in the previous lecture, okay? The first term, the one plus R2 over R1, is generated by the blue part. And the second term, the ratio between the ZS and the ZP, is corresponds to the purple, the frequency selective network. So if you plug in, the series combination of the RC and the parallel combination of the RC, this is what you have. 
Okay, so this is the starting point of this lecture. And then let's substitute the R2 and R1, R and C with the data. So RS, 10 kilo ohm. The capacitor is 16 nanofarad. R2, 20.3, Y.3. Y.3. And R1 is 10 kilo ohm. Okay? So if you plug in this four value, this is the result. The loop gain is the complex. A complex loop gain. So now, what's the question? What was the first question in this lecture? Find the location of what? Of the closed loop poles. Okay? Find the location of the closed loop pole. So how to decide the location of the closed loop pole? The pole of the closed loop transfer function. Use this, right? The location title. The location of the closed loop pole. So use this equation. You command the loop gain, the complex loop gain equals to one. Let me pause for a moment. Can you follow me? Can you follow me? Do you really understand this? Do you really understand this? Why loop gain equals to one? This is Buckhausen criterion, right? So now it's the closed loop pole. So the question you will ask to find the location of closed loop pole. So the closed loop pole means what? Means you focus on the denominator of the closed loop transfer function, right? You focus on the denominator of the closed loop transfer function the denominator of the closed loop transfer function. And here is the definition of the loop gain, the L prime of S minus A times beta. A, beta, and minus sine. The closed loop transfer function can be rewritten as this. Focus on the denominator. One minus L prime of S. To find the closed loop pole, the pole of the closed loop transfer function. So focus on the denominator. So we let the denominator equals zero. Right? Denominator equals zero. Then L prime of S equals to one. Okay, very clear. So let's move forward and then what? And then let's take this back. The formulation for the loop gain. Let's take the formulation of the loop gain back. And then command this loop gain, complex loop gain equal to one and solve what? Solve the complex, solve S. Try to solve the S. Try to solve the S, okay? Try to solve S. So equal to one, then try to solve this second order equation. And then, this is the answer. When I middle school math, so by quadratic equation, and this tells you what? Which side? Which side? S plane, you have the imaginary axis and the real axis. The complex frequency plane. So I was asking you, left hand side of the S plane, or right hand side of the S plane, or imaginary axis. Imaginary, imaginary axis. So obviously, the real part of that complex is positive, okay? So right hand side. But see the ratio between the imaginary, which is one, 
and the real power is 0.015, which is very small, right? So which means what? The angle is almost 90 degrees. Which means the pole is actually very close to the imaginary axis. So just step into the right hand side a little bit. But it's located on the right hand side, of course. But it's very close to the imaginary axis. Okay? So on the top one, it's part with the positive sign. The real part, imaginary, positive. On the bottom, bottom one, the lower one, the real part is positive, but imaginary is negative. It's the complex conjugate pole. Located on the right hand side, but very close to the imaginary axis. Okay? So the sec let's move on to the second question. Remember what the sec what, what the second question was? The pick to pick amplitude of the sinusoidal output signal. Of course, it's decided by this highlight. The nonlinear amplitude control. So pay attention to the polarity, the connection of the two dial. Because the anode is connected to the output, which means what? Which means the lower dial, the green dial, is going to limit the positive, the maximum output signal. And the cathode is pointing, is connected to the output. So it means when the output signal is sync, is lower, is sync, going to the negative direction, if it's too low, too negative, too low, then the dial one will be turned on. So when this happens, then the minimum, the negative, the output signal amplitude in the negative direction will be limited. Okay? In short, the positive, the maximum output signal is limited by the green dial, the D2. And the minimum, the negative output signal is be, it will be limited by the blue dial, the D1. Okay? So now let's try to find this solution. Let's try to solve this. So it's simply just command the D2 on. Because when this happens, that means the corresponding voltage, the upper voltage will be the maximum output voltage, okay? Will be the maximum output signal amplitude, okay? When this on. But, because it's just turn on, right? It's just turn on. So it's barely on, okay? It's turn on. So when the dial is just on, it's turn on. It's barely on, which means we can neglect the dial curve. We can neglect when, for the sake of simplicity. When we solve this by hand, of course we can solve this by simulation in the next lecture. So in the next lecture, I'm gonna, sh gonna show you the SPI simulation result, okay? So this lecture is focused on the hand analysis. So we simply neglect the dial current when the D2 is turned on, and then the green current is now neglect negligible. So let's try to find out the voltage at the orange point. So which is the contribution from the VO and the negative power supply. So you can employ it, the principle of superposition and will give you this result, okay? Let VO0 find the contribution of VEE and let the VE0 find the contribution of VO. All right, principle of superposition. So this is the voltage for the orange. And then subtract the four dial voltage. The four bias dial voltage, which is 0 0.7, equals what? Equal to the green node voltage. The voltage of the cathode of the D2. So which is the inverting, the voltage of the inverting terminal of the up end. Okay, because it's very easy, it's a very simple divided, voltage divided ratio between R2 and R1. Okay, from the VO. So VO times divided by R1 plus R2 times what? 
times R1. Okay? So we simply solve this will tell you the maximum output signal amplitude. Because this is the positive. Because the circuit, based on the circuit symmetry, there's the, a negative, right? The minimum. So it's simply times two can give you the peak to peak swing of the output sinusoidal signal. The peak to peak swing is going to be 21.2 volt. So here's the answer. You got it? You got it? So I want to spend, I want to spend uh, the last a couple of minutes to emphasize a very important concept. So here's the major takeaway. The pole location versus loop gain. The pole location versus loop gain. Why this is the 20.3 kilo, kilo ohm? Because when R2 equals 20.3 kilo ohm, this is the loop gain, right? This is what we have. And then, so R2 equals 20.3 kilo ohm. So what's the loop gain? At the frequency of oscillation. At the frequency of oscillation, the imaginary part is gone. So just you just you just veil, just cover S, the imaginary part. Now what do we see? If you cover, if you killed the S, the imaginary part at the frequency of oscillation, what do you have? 3.03 divided by 3, right? So which means at the frequency of oscillation, the loop gain is 1.01, okay? So it's the, just slightly greater than 1. But what about 20 kilo ohm? If it's 20 kilo ohm, that means what? The numerator is going to be 3. So at the frequency of oscillation, it's going to be 1. So loop gain is exactly equal to 1. So what's the difference? Let me use the root locus to explain this. Okay. On the left-hand side, when R2 equals 20.3 kilo ohm, so I want you to take note on this. Then you see the complex conjugate pole is located on the right-hand side of the S-plane, but very close to it, the imaginary axis. But when the R2 equals on the right-hand side, 20 kilo ohm, when loop at, loop at equals to 1, then the, the complex conjugate pole will sit on the imaginary axis. So based on the root locus criterion, and what this tells us is on the right hand side is the sustained oscillation. Okay? On the left hand side is the growing oscillation. Again, this is the key point. To activate, to initiate, to ensure the oscillation will start at the beginning. We want to make sure this happens. Then the loop gain in the actual design of an oscillator, the engineering design of the oscillator, will be a little bit, will slightly greater than one, but very close to one. All right, so this is the major takeaway and the highlight of this problem solving lecture. I hope you learn something and become more confident in solving a sinusoidal oscillator. Thanks for watching.